Welcome to the fertilization module. In this talk, we're going to learn about the fusion of the sperm and egg during the process of external fertilization. We will first learn about the different types of fertilization and then learn about external fertilization using sea urchins as a model. There are two main types of fertilization, which is the external fertilization and the internal fertilization. In external fertilization, the ovum or the egg is laid outside the organism's body and into the environment. So in such situations, the sperm fuses with the egg in the environment and not in the organism's body. This kind of external fertilization is observed in many different animals like in sea urchins, frogs, fish, and other types of animals. In the case of internal fertilization, the ovum or egg is present within the body of the organism and thus the sperm are able to fuse with the ovum or egg inside the organism's body. Internal fertilization is observed in different organisms like mammals, reptiles, and birds. It should be noted that it is easier to study the process of fertilization when the fertilization is external. In fact, sea urchins have been used as a model organism to study fertilization because they show external fertilization and thus a lot of knowledge that we have gathered about fertilization is through studies performed in sea urchins. Sea urchins are marine spiny globular animals that are invertebrates. They belong to the class of Echinoidea and the phylum of Echinodermata. This is the same phylum where we can also see starfish. Sea urchins have been used as a model organism to study fertilization. In the case of sea urchins, the male and female gametes are released in water. The male gametes have to find the female gametes of the same species for fertilization to occur. Now, since the male gametes have to find the female gametes in an environment of water, many, many sperms are made in the hope that some of them will be able to actually find the appropriate female gamete that belongs to the same species. The male gametes are able to swim in the water to find the female gametes. Thus, in this case, fertilization is external. Let us now look at the different stages of fertilization or the different steps involved in fertilization in sea urchins. So in the case of sea urchins, the sperm and the eggs are in a marine or in a water-based environment. So how does the sperm know where to go to find the egg. So the eggs secrete chemicals after they reach maturation that attract sperms in a species specific manner. This is the way that sperm attraction occurs. Now these chemicals that are secreted will form a concentration gradient that the sperm will follow and hence the sperm attraction is normally through the process of chemotaxis. Now, in addition to chemicals that attract sperms, there are also sperm activating peptides that can be made by some eggs, and these provide the sperm with the direction to swim towards, and thereby they activate the motility of the sperm. Now, here is an example where we can actually observe both sperm attraction and sperm activation. Now, in this figure, the part that's in the blue box, which is the panel A, is basically showing a lot of sperms that are uniformly dispersed in the field of view. Now what we're going to do is we're going to add a very tiny drop of a chemical that can act as both a sperm attractive molecule as well as a sperm activating peptide. So basically it attracts sperm towards it by increasing the motility of the sperm. So in the case of panel B, the compound has just been added into that environment where we see the uniformly distributed sperm. 
Now what we see is with time, like in panel C, the sperms start congregating towards that chemical or they start swimming towards that chemical. And we can see that as the white patch that is being formed towards the lower end of the figure. In figure D, more time has passed and now we can see more and more sperm moving towards that white patch and that white patch becoming bigger. Thus, this is how eggs can secrete certain chemicals and normally they do so after they reach maturation when they are ready for the fertilization process to occur. Now in some cases, the chemical that attracts the sperms and the chemical that activates the sperms can be different or they can be the same. Thus, sperm attraction and sperm activation can be performed by either different compounds or the same compound and it simply depends on the organism. The next stage in fertilization is the acrosome reaction. So once the sperm is able to move towards the egg and approaches the egg, the acrosome reaction can occur. Now in the case of sea urchins, it happens when the sperm contacts the vitellin envelope of the egg. So please remember that sea urchins are invertebrates and hence surrounding the egg they have the vitellin envelope. In the vitellin envelope there are sulfate containing polysaccharides that can interact with the sperm. The contact of the sperm with these polysaccharides causes fusion of the acrosomal vesicles that are present in the sperm head. And the membrane of the acrosomal vesicle fuses with the sperm cell membrane. And this results in the exocytosis of the acrosomal contents. That is what is shown in the figure below. So when we look at the B panel, this is where we are actually seeing the fusion of the acrosomal membrane with the sperm cell membrane. And that results in the release of the contents in the acrosome, which are the acrosomal enzymes. They are released into the extracellular space. Once this release occurs, there is an extension of the sperm acrosomal process. The enzymes that are released can digest a path through the jelly coat to the exo surface. After the acrosome reaction, the next step is the recognition of the ex extracellular coat. And when the sperm reaches the surface of the egg after penetrating through the vitellin envelope, it must be able to bind to the surface of the egg for fusion to occur. In the case of sea urchins, the binding is mediated by a protein present on the sperm called binding. It is normally present on the acrosomal process as shown in the figure. In the figure, we can see the finger-like acrosomal process and right around it, we can see this dark coloration, which is basically the location of the binding protein. Now, different species produce the binding protein where the protein sequence is slightly different. This divergence in the binding sequence aids in species-specific interactions. So as we saw previously, Sperm attraction and sperm activation is done in a species-specific manner. Now we see again that recognition of the egg's extracellular coat can also be done in a species-specific manner through the use of different proteins, for example, in this case, binding. Now eggs have binding receptors that can interact with the binding that is present in the sperm. Now for fertilization to occur, the male and the female gametes must fuse, or basically their membranes have to fuse together. Now the fusion of the gametes begins with the fusion of the membranes, which is mediated by proteins which are called as fusogenic proteins. Binding is an example of a fusogenetic protein. Now in ideal conditions, we want only one sperm to fuse with the egg and that way the zygote that is formed will be a diploid zygote since the sperm and the egg are both haploid. 
So when we have one sperm fusing with an egg, it is called as monospermy. Now, when you have the fusion of multiple sperm with an egg, it is called as polyspermy. Polyspermy is highly undesirable. The main reason it's undesirable is because polyspermy results in a zygote that has more than the normal number of chromosomes. For example, if we had two haploid sperms fusing with one haploid egg, the resulting zygote has three sets of chromosomes and hence will be triploid. On the other hand, if we had three sperms fusing with one egg, the resulting zygote will have four sets of chromosomes instead of two, and hence will be a tetraploid instead of a diploid. Such zygotes are normally they either die and hence are unviable, or they undergo abnormal development and once again will eventually die. Thus, polyspermy is highly undesirable and hence there are mechanisms to block polyspermy. Polyspermy can be blocked by various mechanisms and we're going to look at two ways it is blocked in the sea urchins. Now one way polyspermy can be blocked is by changing the electrical potential of the egg cell membrane. And this is normally done immediately after the sperm enters. And hence it is called as the fast block to polyspermy because it happens very quickly. It results in the resting membrane potential of the egg membrane to change from a negative resting potential, which is usually minus 70 millivolts, to a positive resting potential, which is about plus 20 millivolts. Now, a sperm cannot fuse with an egg cell membrane that has a positive resting potential. Thus, by changing the electric potential of the egg cell membrane, polyspermy can be prevented. Now, this block to polyspermy is transient and very short-lived. This change in membrane potential lasts for probably a minute or so. And hence, you need another mechanism that is more long-term to prevent polyspermy. The second way by which polyspermy is prevented is through the cortical granules. Now, the cortical granules that are present in the cortex of the egg fuse to the egg cell membranes and release their contents into the space between the egg cell membrane and the vitellin envelope through the process of exocytosis. Now this is the place where we will be having all the sperms present ready to fuse with the eggs. So by releasing the, cord the contents of the cortical granules, polyspermy can be blocked. And this is called as the slow block to polyspermy. In this case, calcium ions that are released into the cytoplasm after fertilization occurs initiate the cortical granule reaction. The cortical granule reaction is when the cortical granules fuse to the egg cell membrane. The enzymes that are released as a result of this fusion can, leave, can cleave various proteins present on the sperm cell as well as the egg cell like the binding receptors present on the egg cell membranes. Let us look at this cortical granule reaction in the context of this figure. So when you look at the surface of the egg, the egg cell membrane has these finger-like projections, which are the microvilli. Right outside that, we have the villain envelope, and the sperm is trying to enter through the villain envelope to contact the egg. Right below the cell surface membrane of the egg are the cortical granules. This is the cortex region. And here we can see the cortical granules, which have their contents in them that include many enzymes. Now, when a sperm is able to contact the egg cell membrane through its acrosomal process, now remember we're still learning about the sea urchins, and in sea urchins, the sperms will form that acrosomal process. So when the contact happens with the acrosomal process of the sperm with the egg cell membrane, these cortical granules that are present intracellularly in the egg 
will fuse with the egg sur cell surface membrane and the contents of the cortical granules will be released into the environment. Now we can see these in the electron micrographs shown in the blue box where before fertilization we can see the intact cortical granules and after fertilization we can no longer see those granules that are present simply because the cortical granule reaction has occurred. The Thus the cortical granule reaction allows enzymes to be into the extracellular area which then prevents polyspermy. The cortical granule reaction also forms a fertilization envelope in the sea urchin zygote. Now the fertilization envelope that is formed protects the embryo. And remember all this is happening in a water body like the ocean. And so the embryo needs some protection against those tidal currents and that is what the fertilization envelope does. Now when we look at this figure right here, we're looking at a sea urchin egg and all the, that's in the form of that white circle. And right around that entire white circle where we can see these filamentous structures, those are all the sperms that are interacting with the egg. Now in panel B, we've seen that where the arrowhead is, that is where a sperm has entered the egg and that has caused the cortical granule reaction to occur and the fertilization envelope is developing. Now as you can see where the arrowhead is, you don't see that many filamentous structures simply because as the fertilization envelope is developing, the sperms are no longer interacting with the egg and thus this is one way polyspermy is being prevented. In panel C, we can see that the envelope is extending throughout the egg surface and lesser and lesser sperm are bound to that zygote. Finally, the envelope covers the entire zygote and now we don't see any sperms interacting with the zygote. Thus, the cortical granule reaction results in the formation of the fertilization envelope. With this, we come to the end of our talk, where we learned about the different steps involved in the fusion of male and female gametes during external fertilization.